Gettysburg, 1863, July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. Union and Confederate forces will fight here on these fields. Thousands will die, both Union and Confederate. And this year we celebrate 160 years to the Battle of Gettysburg. Over the next five episodes of Weekend Travels, we're going to take you through Gettysburg, show all the excitement that there is around the 160th anniversary to the battle. Hey there guys, my name is George, I'm your host of Weekend Travels and this is a very special series entitled The 160th Anniversary to the Battle of Gettysburg. We're going to explore all three days in a five episode, including ending with a Gettysburg 4th of July celebration. So let's get started. Come join us. June the 30th. 1863, Union Cavalry General John Buford rode into the Crossroads village of Gettysburg with two brigades of horsemen. Men, women, and children crowded the sidewalks and vied with each in demonstration of joyous welcome. What little did the citizens know is that there would be a great battle in Gettysburg and the stage was set for the largest bloodiest and most well-known battle of the Civil War to begin the next morning, July the 1st, 1863. Much like generals and troops moving into town, the anniversary weekend is slowly getting its own stage as tourists from all over make their way into Gettysburg for what will be a big weekend. This weekend, I decided to play tourist and take a part in the festivities of the 160th anniversary. The first stop on my list was to pay a visit to a newly minted museum that opened up this past spring called Beyond the Battle by the Adams County Historical Society. This museum encompasses the history of not just Gettysburg, but Adams County as a whole. And what better way to start anniversary weekend than by learning about the history of Adams County and how it became known as we know it today. As you enter in the museum, you will notice small exhibits off to the side, including this one dedicated to Ken Burns, who filmed the documentary series on the Civil War and a few other public exhibits. Towards the back, you will find the Alexander Dobbins Special Exhibit Gallery. And for this special 160th weekend, they have a special exhibit on early photography at Gettysburg. The exhibit focuses on the importance of early photography at Gettysburg, from tintype photos to the cameras used by the photographers themselves. In this collection, there is a very special photo that was taken by the Tyson brothers. Charles and Isaac Tyson moved from Philadelphia to Gettysburg in 1859. They were among the earliest photographers to capture images of the town and the battlefield after the war. 
pictured below is one of the most famous photos from Gettysburg. This photo captures President Lincoln's procession to the Soldiers National Cemetery on November 16, 1863. The photo in this collection is only one of three ever printed before the negative was destroyed. We leave the special exhibit and head into the main museum itself. From a family home caught in the crossfire during the Battle of Gettysburg to a uniform worn during the pandemic of 1918, the Beyond the Battle Museum captures the history of Adams County from its birth all the way to the present times in an immersive way so people can live it. The museum is divided into sections, exploring the rock formations that created Devil's Den 200 million years ago, the lives of Gettysburg's Native Americans, and stories of the frontier. You can take a seat in Samuel Getty's 18th Century Tavern and explore local ties to abolitionist Thaddeus Stevens, including this chair that he would have sat in. Towards the end, you hit an exhibit about the discussion of Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. From the many faces of civilians who witnessed November 16, 1863, to the artifacts hosting a president and a short film. The exhibit ends exploring more contemporary history with Eisenhower artifacts, artifacts of tourism history, and the wall of Gettysburg nobles past and present. Like any museum, it opens up to the gift shop that sells official Beyond the Battle t-shirts, books, mugs, and anything a local or tourist may like. Beyond the Battle Museum is a must when you visit Gettysburg, especially for locals like myself, exploring what there is to offer for the 160th anniversary. To find out more information, visit achs-pa.org for admission prices, times, and special exhibits offered. So the Gettysburg Beyond the Battle or the Adams County Historical Society is a place worth checking out when you're in Gettysburg. It's open 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. to do a special events, tickets, and of course, people like me who work in town. If you are a destination Gettysburg, have that card, you can actually get them for free with one person. But historically, I love this museum. This museum is excellent. They did such an amazing job. Our next stop is only a short drive through town over to the Gettysburg National Military Museum, where we will hop on a bus to head over to the George Spangler Farm. The George Spangler Farm is only open certain days of the year, and this would be my first visit there. 1848, they had four children, Harriet, Sabina, Daniel, and Benaya. Now, Benaya was the only one that was here, uh, was born here on the property. The other ones kind of came, were already born. All four children lived to adulthood. Um, three of them stayed in the area. Daniel um, left the area and he moved to Kansas. Uh, but all the other three lived in the Gettysburg area. Um, all accounts, the farm was thriving at the time of the battle. Uh, the buildings that were here, uh, the house, the big stone house, it's bigger than what it was at the time of the battle, uh, but because it's been um, re renovated, so everything inside is 21st century, but at least you can get a sense of what the house looks like. Uh, the summer kitchen is the small uh, stone house. Um, that is where the, we think that Confederate General Lewis Armistead died in that summer kitchen. The smokehouse is that little white building and the, when they uh, got to the smokehouse it was in such bad repair they had to tear it down and rebuild a new one which was kind of sad because when you open the door to the old smoke smokehouse and walk in you could still smell the smoke. Yeah, I mean it was just had that smoky bacon -y smell to it so we were kind of disappointed that they couldn't do that again but that's the way life goes. Uh, we also have a bank barn, 
Um, it's built into a bank, and a lot of the bank uh, barns in Pennsylvania were considered bank barns. Um, George, I think, was aware that the Confederates were in the area in June. Uh, he knew that they were there. Um, you can see this is what it looked like in June. And of course, this is what it looked like the first day of the battle. This is where the Spangler Farm was. Most of the farms in the area were turned into hospitals. And so, and basically the military didn't ask you, can I use your farm for a hospital? Um, they just took it. So they took this particular farm and it was the Union 11th Corps Field Hospital that it became. Um, Spangler Farm, great location because you had two main roads, you had a good water supply, um, and so it was excellent for not only a farm, but for the hospital. It also became the area for the artillery reserve. So they had artillery reserve here. They had the provost marshal, which is basically your military police. We're down at the end of the street. So they kind of really utilized the area. Um, they gave the Spangers the option, you can go or you can stay. Well, George says, I'm not leaving this farm. <laughs> so they stayed, the whole family stayed, but they consigned them to a room up on the second floor of the house, and that's kind of where they stayed. Now, we think they probably helped out as best they could, but um, that was kind of where they were supposed to stay. After the battle, armies moved on. Um, farm basically was in shambles. Crops were gone, livestock all killed and eaten. <laughs> Uh, wood fencing was gone. Um, doors, they used the doors from the barn as operating tables. Um, so the farm basically was in really bad shape when they finally left. Most of the wounded did leave in August. They went over to a general hospital called Camp Letterman. Um, it's on the east, east end of town. George was able to restore the farm. Um, within 10 years, he had it back up and running. Matter of fact, it was in better shape than it was before. So that, that's the good German stock right there. <laughs> um, as far as we know, he, was, he put in for reimbursement, but we don't know whether he really got a whole lot back from that. So that was not you know, a real profitable thing for him. Cameos that they would use. So they'd be cornered off. We would usually be about a mile away from the battle lines. From that mile, they'd be carted here, and a lot of guys died on the way here because it was so bumpy. They don't have roads like we have today. It was mostly ruts and mud trails and everything else. Yeah, and a lot of bouncing. So some of them people did die on the way here because they bounced around so bad. The ones that did survive would be laid out here in front of us, and they would be sorted. Now, all surgery was done under the eaves of the barn behind you. There have been four tables having operation done for three days straight non-stop. Um, roughly it was about um, two, four, six, eight, eight doctors. You would have a steward and then you have assistant surgeons also there at a table. The world has changed in this. So you had roughly four to five people at per table working. So I wasn't alone doing this. So they would be put on the table and if they had a lower leg wound, <laughs> Especially with my sanity, my humanity. Like this. These are bullet wounds that you can do uh. looking at. It. So it would go in small, come out big. And the reason that is is because the bullets are made out of soft lead. So when they hit bone or anything like that, they would bust them out. And basically carrying the bone and everything else out through creating the bigger hole as you have today. Mm -hmm. So you, we have we have bullet holes we dealt with, after two weeks, I don't feel and then we also dealt with cannonballs. This is a cannonball blast. This is a 22-year-old soldier on the inside. side um, saw a cannonball coming towards him. He thought he could stop with his foot, put his foot out, 
And just don't say anything that yeah. happens. And he thought he, well, he wanted to stop it. And it jumped and, and basically eviscerated the back of his mm-hmm. calf there. I either get too little help or I get so, the worst cases. Of course. Of course. That happened. So that is kind of thrown through. Yeah. We knew that what to do right right away with that. I, I actually but with some, bullet wounds, we had to stick our finger in to figure out what's going on inside in out, the of that the wound. So I our finger, remember, there was no germ theory. We didn't wash our hands or anything like that. Well, we did wash our hands, but not as much as we did back then. If you're new, so we take our finger, stick it in the wound, feel around. We're feeling around for broken bones, anything broken, bullets, anything like that. If we did feel a bullet or something we cannot penetrate far enough down, we can take this guy. This is a bullet probe. We insert into the wound, feel around, pull back out. If there's a gray mark on the porcelain tip, it's a bullet. If there's no gray Always mark, we hit a bone, there's no bullet, we need to continue. If the bullet's in there, bullet forceps, removers, go in, pull it out, and reevaluate. For this case, we're going to say there's no bullet, bullet went the way through, and we need to amputate the leg. So we have to do, under 10 minutes, we got to do an operation. So we got to anesthetize the patient, we're going to take an ether cone like this, we're going to take chloroform or ether, today we can use ether. About 15 uh, to 20 drops. Calls, they come when I call. Hold it there for about a minute, minute and a half. Have to build that mentality. And he's asleep. Okay. Once he's asleep, we pull that away. He's no longer resisting or anything like that. So we're going to put a tourniquet on. Screw it down nice and tight. We're going to get the bleeding down to an ooze. We want it to slowly bleed. We don't want it to stop bleeding. Because we don't want clots to form yet. I've done physical so now we got two bone we got two I've knives to choose rehabs. we got a lister knife which is yeah. basically a steak yeah. knife yeah. this is a one bone knife yeah. or we have a catlin okay. knife oh, no. this is a two bone knife <laughs> why that is is because it's sharp on both sides it. it goes in between the bones and cuts the muscle out to relieve the tension so we can do the operation properly it. she's been doing it as long as i have so we we're gonna go one hand's breadth above the knee the reason we do that is because the the prosthetic they're going to get is one size fits all please be careful so most men's knees are both about the same height if you look. So we're gonna go one hand breadth above the knee. I'm gonna make the cut there. So I'm gonna take my list, my lister knife. And I'm gonna create a flat cut. So I'm gonna fillet it all the way around three different times. I'm gonna make three flaps. Pull that back. What do I see underneath the skin? Is your muscle? You need some ice. Yeah, ice. So when we hit muscle, we got to take our scalpel and cut down through. As we're cutting down through, we have eight major veins of artery that tie off in your leg. So we use this little guy. It's called a tenaculum. On this would be black silk thread already looped on here in circles. So we go in, we pick and pull and tie off those arteries and veins. We retract muscle back. Now we see bone. So we need a bone saw, and that's what this is, a bone saw. Depending on how sharp this is, usually we try to keep these very sharp. About 15, 20 passes down through the bone, the limbs removed, and dumped into a limb pile. Can now, imagine the smell. Yeah. Now remember, four tables, three days straight, non-stop surgery, that limb pile is going to build up real fast. So what they would do is they would have convalescent men that could no longer return to the front of the line. They can walk around, but they can't return to the front line. They would take wheelbarrows of limbs and cart them off to the orchard behind you where they would have holes dug and they'd dump the limbs into them. So, and that's where the orchard also is where they buried some of the dead patients also. So now I have exposed bone, muscle, and skin. So I gotta trim that, I gotta make sure that bone is nice and clean and smooth. So we use a bone file like this, and we file that bone nice and clean. Once that bone is nice and clean and smooth, then now we can pack it. We pull down the muscle and we pull down the skin. We take packing gauze and cotton and pack into there, gauze, and it goes in. Now we pull that skin down and we tack it shut. Now we don't close it, we tack it because that's going to stay in there and be changed out repeatedly as it heals because we want this to pus and we want this to ooze. So we want the pus to be coming out and healing. So now we have that tack shut. I'm going to let go of the tourniquet here. Make sure there's nothing gushing out. 
nothing gushing out, we're doing good, everything held. Now we take a stump bandage. Now, why do we use red and not white? I'm sorry, so it stands here for another couple of hours. The reason we use red is because psychological, if this guy sees his, when he wakes up and sees this white thing turning red, he's going to freak out. Oh, it's always red. It's always red, so he doesn't know it's bleeding. So we're going to put the stump on, the stump bandage on like this. We're going to take a bandage like this, and we're going to wrap it around, and we're done. Under 10 minutes, roughly 10 minutes. Yeah, roughly 10 minutes. He's done. Now we're going to wake him up. You know, hey, Fred, wake up. Hey, wake up. Take her hat, flash some air over him. We wanted him to get air into him so we could wake him up. He's not responding fast enough. So we can take a little bit of a chloroform, which is an alcohol base, which evaporates really fast, dump on a groin. As that evaporates, it's gonna turn cold really fast and he's gonna go, <gasps> that gasp, that gasp of air, fresh air goes into the lungs, takes whatever chloroform ether into the lungs, expels it out, and he starts waking up a lot faster. Once he wakes up, we remove him off the table. And at what pain level is he at from that? Probably not a lot because he's still doped up because he had opium, about six pills of opium before he hit our table. Now he gets up off our table, goes to, now his confederate, he goes into the wagon shed, which is at the end of the, the bay here, underneath the barn here, there's a gap there. That's the wagon shed. That's where the confederates were held. There was a soldier on either end and that's where they were guarded. If it was a union, he would be placed up in the barn or along the, along the grass here. So he'd be moved off of there, and then I go next, they bring the next patient up, and we start all over again. Now, as a doctor, treating each patient the same? Yes, no matter what you are. Now, the only time it changes is if your rank. Now, if they're, like, we had General Armistead show up on the barn here, on the field here. He was taken, everyone was, whoever was finished, took him first. Everyone had to wait. He was, he had surgery done to him. He was placed in the summer kitchen, away from everyone else because of his ranking. He was put in the summer kitchen. And there's a wayside exhibit over there explaining that, where he passed away eventually. So he had privilege because of rank? Yes. But it does, but again, it doesn't matter because of the, of the what you wore, Confederate Union, it was still the same. This rank mattered. Because they are there, we look up to them. They're the ones calling the shots, so we need to take care of them first. Not only did the George Spangler Farm get used as a field hospital during the battle, it was also the long arm of the Union Army. On July 2, 1863, the fields would have been filled with over 110 cannon, countless limbers and caissons, nearly 1,500 horses, and as many as 2,376 men, all part of the massive artillery reserve of the Union Army of the Potomac. Now the farm itself, as said by the surgeon, was used as a field hospital during the Battle of Gettysburg. Countless men, both Union and Confederate, were lying up injured, waiting to be seen. And inside this barn, it has been estimated that 500 wounded and dying men waited. Crammed so closely together that they passed deadly infectious diseases, such as typhoid fever, to one another. Um, they closed their administrations by the end of 65. Mm -hmm. In 66, I think they had their last meeting, and then that was, they were finished. But um, over 5,000 were given commissions. This is clergy, primarily, or seminary students, some, some physicians uh, as volunteer delegates during the course of the war. Uh, there was a ladies' auxiliary established by 1863. Hey, Kevin. Um, and they did similar relief work. Uh, there weren't as many uh, ladies that were working with the Christian Commission, but it was a ladies' Christian commission. Um, their concern, which was interesting, uh, developed out of the diets for the soldiers. So they wanted to uh, provide relief in a specialized diet. And that, that work was done under a lady named Annie Whitmire. She was from Keokuk, Iowa. 
and um, she worked with the sanitary commission for some time and then she she uh, noticed a lot of red tape with the sanitary commission and she liked what the Christian commission was doing and decided to, to give her services to the Christian Commission. Mm -hmm. So she established the, the dye kitchens. And usually they were, they were done in uh, stationary locations where the Army had uh, control of cities. Washington, D.C., uh, Nashville, Tennessee was one. First hospitals were established in May 64 mm -hmm. out there uh, for the dye kitchens. So they had lady managers uh, who were giving commissions through through the Christian Commission. And consequently, those lady managers were, were some of the first to be recognized as women nurses and given pensions after the war hmm. for their service. There were many set up for the 160th this weekend at the George Spangler Farm, including this tin types, an amber types photographer out of Baltimore, Maryland, Jay Milliker who still keeps the old practice alive of 18th century photography. You simply make a seat in the neck, pull the artery up a little bit, and then you put a little notch in the carotid artery. Take a flow tube, hook it on the hose from a gravity bottle, and you stick that in the carotid artery. Beside the carotid artery, jugger vein. Pull the jugger vein up, Cut the jugular vein off completely. The pressure from the gravity bottle or pump will force all the blood out. Eventually, you get the bottom foot to come out on both sides, you cut that jugular okay. vein off. Now, during the Civil War, if the doctors had four or five to do, they would go in town and hire people. And they come out and have them do the embalming. Bring them out and say, All right, in a pail, I need a gallon of arsenic, two pounds of mercury. Three quarts of sugar lead, so much fennel, so much alcohol, so much creosote. Let them stir it up. They got spice that was on them. They made a mess of putting in the gravity bottle or a pump. They cleaned the mess up. So, what kind of fluid was, re was the blood replaced with? Arsenic, mercury, zinc, sugar lead, so mm -hmm. fennel, alcohol, even creosote. Mm. My goodness. There was no chemical company selling bombing fluid until 1888 when Dodge started selling formaldehyde. Okay. Formaldehyde was invented after the Civil War. And humiliation, so they wouldn't commit an issue again. Robert probably explained to you gambling was illegal, being drunk was illegal, stealing, of course, is illegal, and any other crime that's like a crime today is against the law, against army regulations, so you can be punished. Again, embarrassment. This guy refused to fight, he was a coward, so they're marching him through town. They have a fife and drum here to make all kind of noise so people come out of their houses to see the coward. Down here is an actual photograph. This guy's a thief that says thief on the board. You look in the back, fifer and drummer making all kind of ruckus so people know this thief is being marched down the street and who he is. And you're wearing a sign on you. It's embarrassing. Here's a guy, too fond of whiskey. You drank too much whiskey. You take a barrel. barrel, you cut the top of the barrel off. Now they're heavy. You make them wear that barrel. Who knows what else is in that barrel? They could have they could have shipped salt pork in there, greasy, greasy food. Now you're wearing that stinky barrel around and they're marching you through town. You can see the other soldiers donning their hats and laughing at them. Back humiliation. But if I want to inflict some pain and really send a message, and this is probably my favorite part. wasn't going to exchange a black I would take you and strap you to the spare wheel in the back of an artillery caisson. I'd four point you, your arms and legs, and sit you right on top of that big iron hub. And then I would hook a big old draft horse up to the front of that, and I would pull you down the bumpy roads. Now, the roads back then aren't quite as bumpy as they are in Pennsylvania today, but they were still nonetheless bumpy. Now, can you imagine you're bouncing up and down on that thing? as you're sitting on it. So that sends a message. Hey, what did Joe do? Well, Joe was gambling, fighting, and drinking last night. Well, I'm never going to fight, gamble, and drink as long as I live because I saw what happened to Joe. So it sends a message. A lot of it was about inf inflicting some minor minor pain and punishment, but mostly about humiliation and deterrence. So, you know, you see it, I'm not going to do that. Uh, and you were the guys that did this to the other guys. Provo, yes, that was their job. Now, you can imagine. <laughs> If you were one of those lucky guys who got to do behind the lines provo duty, guarding a field hospital or in a provo officer or, or prisoners, maybe that's not too bad. 
But imagine now you you've been a temporary duty. You've been your red your your company or whatever has been pulled out, and you have to take care of the punishment of your own fellow soldiers. And now, and once you've done that duty, and if you don't do it, if the provost marshal and the officer are the one that determine the punishment, you're just the one that has to carry it out on your own fellow soldiers. Again, additional duty. Then you go back to your unit. Now, what if you get in trouble? And one of these other persons who was in trouble in the past now gets assigned a provo duty. Hey, Brian, I remember when you were a provo. I'm going to make sure. So if you get one of the guys you got assigned to do this kind of stuff, fellow, you know, punishment on your own fellow soldiers, not real popular I wish the Spanish family were here. That's why when they brought in, they started having guys doing uh, Veterans Reserve and other folks doing it who were doing it as more permanent duty. A lot of the guys you know, were, were a lot happier. Of course, they took up a lot of the behind the lines duties, mm. and then more of those guys ended up having to do just this. How long did the shaming last? How long did you wear the bear? Well, it depends on the nature of the infraction. Oh. It was the provo marshal or the or the uh, commander at whatever level at, at the regiment or whatever who got to determine the punishment. These guys, these guys just carried it out. It was just depending on. Quiet over there. Yeah, just quiet. Confederate it's prisoner right there. Quiet down. So it's up. It was dependent on the nature of the crime. They had what we call in modern military. They called non-judicial punishment. Those were for all those non-capital crimes, and it was up to the provost marshal or the commanding officer to determine that punishment. Just like in modern day, if it was a capital crime, you know, theft, desertion, murder, or something like that, that's when it had to be brought before a courts martial. If it was possible where you were going to be incarcerated or executed, those kind of crimes had to go through a military court system, which they would do in the field and everything, but they were tried just like any one military in a military system. It wasn't that they just grabbed the guys, took them out back, and shot them or whatever. That was not permitted. You did have to have a, a trial. As we walk around the George Spangler farm, we can see all the renovations that were done to the house and property itself, including the newly built smokehouse, which she had to rebuild from scratch. Replenish the horses much, much quicker than the Confederates could. So, and I don't think anybody who left home in 61 on the dad's horse came home with that horse because it was probably shot and of no use anymore after six eight months it just depends on how hard the animal's ridden jeb stewart led a raid around the union army in 62 that was a lot of hard riding over three days so the animals when they got back the ones that survived the whole mess would have needed a lot of rest and a lot of feed mm -hmm. so was your great uncle in the war yes 62nd virginia uh, he was he made sergeant. Did he survive the war? Not all of him did. He lost a leg at Fisher's Hill in '64. Mm. He took took one of these right to the knee. Oh my. Oof. He was taken prisoner on the field. The Union surgeon took his leg off, and he spent the duration at Fort McHenry. Yeah, wow. you did, you did, would not want to get hit by a mini ball. In the no, 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 no. Not one of my uh, bucket list items. <laughs> We now say goodbye to the George Spangler farm. For my first visit, it was fascinating and is worth a visit on your next trip to Gettysburg. To find out more information, you can visit the Gettysburg Foundation's website at gettysburgfoundation.org slash George Spangler Farm. All right, it's time for food. We're going to an old haunt of mine, a place that I've done before. We're gonna go back to Hunt's Battlefield Fries. Hunt's Battlefield Fries has been around since 2001 and offers the best cheese steaks and fries in town. To learn more about Hunt's, make sure to watch a very special 160th anniversary special of PND Studios Food Travels tomorrow. Links will be in the About section below. With the end of June the 30th, the citizens will have a rude awakening at 7.30 a.m. The Battle of Gettysburg will now officially start it. See you next week, guys. Happy travels.